TV shows. Uh, is there one that stands out as your favorite or your most iconic out of the bunch? I think for me, I have to say Christian Bale, uh, mainly because it was my first uh, introduction to that. It was the first time I was ever exposed to was having a sleepover party for his 90th birthday, and it was on in the living room, and everybody was in the other room eating, and I was transfixed. I was glued to the TV watching this movie and watching Heath Ledger in his nurse costume walk around the blowing up hospital. And that kind of image was ingrained in my mind. And uh, I think, I mean, obviously, I think everybody can agree that Christian Bale is a phenomenal actor. He did a phenomenal job. Bale, not my voice. Hello. Oh, really? <laughs> I didn't see my eyes. Really? Yeah. We gotta hear it now. <laughs> no. <laughs> I never really perfected it. No? What about you, Sean? Uh, obviously, Alfred's been interpreted a couple of times, yeah. uh, but never as deeply. And I think that, uh, is there a, a performance that you looked at to be like, hey, this is an interesting interpretation? Uh, or did you draw a source material from somewhere else? It's a, it's a very tricky one when you're stepping into size 10, so it's Michael Caine and Mr. Goff, you know, because the, the, the it was, a, it was a sort of a hybrid. I tried to stay away as much as I possibly could because we're seeing Alfred at a time that he had never been seen before. Um, but what I really loved about Goff's performance was the ease in which he could navigate himself around Michael Keaton's Bruce Wayne. There was a real closeness and warmth there, which um, I loved. But I also loved the blue collar aspect of uh, Sir Michael Caine. He dropped a couple of sort of like keynotes for me, the fact that he fought in Yemen, which he connected me to the SAS idea, which we introduced. Um, so it was a kind of a hybrid, but like I said before, it, you have to try and walk away from such iconic roles as that when you're breathing life into and giving a heartbeat to your own interpretation of the character, especially at a time when he's still a vital person and physical, as you know, my one is, you know, not shy to punching someone on the nose. The fact that he, uh, that he, um, yeah, anyway, so there you go, yeah. Do you think, or have you heard talk about, like, and I don't know if this is all happening, but I heard there was a show in development about even, Alfred even further back. Do you think that your performance helped them go, oh, there's a story here, we can go even further back? Well, it's actually by Danny Cannon and, and Bruno Heller, who are our show writers, uh, runners. Uh, and you know, I straight away presumed that I would be involved in some capacity. And sadly, I'm not. I sort of tried to convince Bruno Hanna that I could be in the beginning of the show, like Fraggle Rock, and sort of saying, "Oh, I remember the time when I should actually kick a clock right the old thing." They never really came so much. But what I am taking away from it is that from the, the liturgy of millions of DC fans out there, that there's enough interest. And I hope I've had a little bit of something to do with that. In character that was considered a dusty old stage that was just around to actually being a vital person with history. And that's what Bruno and Danny have done so well with Oswald Cobble Park, with the British Robin Wood Taylor and, and Corey Michael Smith and with, with everybody else, is he gave them a reason to exist, he gave them their own heartbeat. Um pre-Micra and pre sort of Batman camp. So yeah, so there you go. I want to open it up to the audience here, and because it's really dark, I can't actually see if someone's standing at the microphone. But if you do have a question, step up and like maybe wait. Like I don't see anybody there, but I see somebody walking right over there. So yes, please. Uh, when you do talk right into the microphone, let us know what your name is and what your question is. How about you, right over there? Yes, uh, my name is Zen, and I have two questions. The first one's for Danny. Um, I'm pretty sure that I'm not sure, but. <laughs> Do you like uh, Rick and Morty? Is that right? <laughs> I love Rick and Morty. All right. My first question is, what's your favorite Rick and Morty episode? Uh, my favorite Rick and Morty episode is Total Rick All. I want to say it's season two, episode seven. Um, it's the one where they don't know who's real. And uh, yeah, it's great. It's my favorite one. That's a good one. Um, and my second question is, so I know that you started acting on the since you were 12 years old. And at the moment, I'm making a movie myself. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. And I was wondering for any advice for acting, or I'm directing and I'm just and also acting. Is any advice? Um, I think Sean could probably do a better, better job answering this, but I guess what I would say is 
nobody's going to believe that you're the character unless you believe it. I think that's the first step, and that's something that um, I know that a lot of times when I'm you know, working on a new character, I overlook, and uh, you have to really figure out. My, my, my acting coach always says, ask the why, and then ask why to that why, and then ask why to that why. Um, always try to go deeper, go as deep as you can, figure out what this person eats for breakfast in the morning, um, and create as full a picture as you can, even if it seems thoroughly unnecessary. It will, um, it will come back and only be beneficial, but I think so. Okay. I mean, the thing is, fair play is just, just, just prepare yourself for rejection, because most people in other professions get rejected from jobs or lose jobs three or four times in their life, and we do five times a week, you know, often. And the thing is, as I've said, is all we have um, is difference, is, is our own difference, is who we are. And as, as that being said, if you know who that, who that character is, you're never going to fit into the perfect slot, the round peg into the round hole for the director, because the director often doesn't know what he wants. So the thing is, it's just preparation to treat every audition that you ever have as a finished end. Um, um, and, and the best of luck can be prepared for rejection, but learn from that. I'll see you in the casting rooms in about a week's time, actually. <laughs> Thank you so much. Here. Further to that, is that a lot of work? Like, when I think about that, like when I think of acting, I don't like doing it, because I'd rather just be myself. And when you talk about all that preparation, do you think a stronger actor, those kind of questions, you say the why, ask the why of the why, and uh, prepare each audition to the best of your ability, that comes naturally to a successful actor? Like, should it be hard work, or should it flow through you? Well, often you, you never know why you get a job in the morning. Often you don't know why you get the job in the first place. Often you find yourself getting work um, when you've already got a job. And when you don't have a job and you really want that job, you have that sort of hunting, it's like looking around. So you, you never, it's, a, it's, a, it's an untenable sort of question really because you never really know why you do get it. Often you just don't get the time. You don't get the time to prepare. prepare. I think in an ideal world, when you have the job, the subtextual element of it is the most important thing. But, um, but that's what I was saying about the audition process, which is now so ridiculously fast. I mean, you get a script the night before, David was just telling me, like, you get a script, eight pages you have to learn by 10 o'clock the next morning or something. You don't really know what they want. So what you can really do with your hand on your heart is be yourself. Yeah? Boom, boom. <laughs> Take it from this time. Favorite all-time favorite moment while filming them. Oh gosh. When you stabbed me. Yeah, that was pretty fun. <laughs> um, there have been a lot of favorite moments for me. I don't know if I could pick one specific moment. Um, I ooh. something that comes to mind right now when you think about it. You know the best one, but a memorable one. A memorable one was my fight with Jerome in season three in the Hall of Mirrors. Um, it was definitely one of my favorite moments, and, and the moment right after that when I come out and, and meet Alfred and realize that he's not dead. Um, I've, had a, I've had a few of those over the course of the show, but um, you know, it, it, that, that kind of, that, that set, that day, meant a lot to me because, and also reading the script and the preparation of it, it was, it broke a lot of barriers for Bruce, it broke a lot of barriers for Bruce and Alfred's relationship, it broke a lot of barriers for Bruce and Jerome's relationship. Um, I think in that episode, Bruce became not only a reactionary uh, hero, but an active hero, if that makes any sense. Um, he, it was the first time he did something completely by his own initiative and took down the bad guy, because not, not because there was a knife to his throat, well there kind of was, but um, may, may, mainly because he, like, he, not, he not only escaped, but he also went back and it, it's, a, it's a subtle difference, but to me it was a really big step for, for Bruce, and um, it just meant a lot. So, and also working with Cameron Monaghan, Sean, working with our director um, Lewis, um, it was it was just a really really big company, and it was just a very memorable day. Uh, yeah, one of my favorite, like, several, like, with David, 
personally one of my favourites was when um, we were allowed to come out of the manor for the first time. So we got a little devil making cups of tea and sitting in the manor. And they eventually released Master Bruce and Alfred out onto the streets to confront uh, Tommy Elliot, which was the bully who was being beaten by his parents. And I give him his father's watch and intend to have a word with Tommy, Tommy Elliot. And for me, there was a very important scene because it was, a, it, was a, it was almost like a germination of the seed of the man that he later becomes. And their relationship, all of a sudden they found each other through this element of standing up for yourself, not taking it, and, and like, a, and like a, and a, and a, and basically attacking a bully and, and refusing to accept a bully. Um, and I, that was one of my sort of favourite moments because it was a combination of so many things for, for David and I, and this was in season one, right, yeah, that we were, we were outside and we became part of the world in many respects. And it was the first time you see the, the like I said, repeating myself, the germination of the seed of the man that eventually dons the cow. Right on this side here. Hi. My name is Adrienne, and I have to say I completely enjoyed your show. It was very dark, but I really enjoyed watching the series. I know that I think it's coming out, so I won't ask you about that. But I am curious for both of you, what are your plans after this show? And I am asking both that are you going to continue acting, or what are your plans at this point? Um, I definitely hope to continue acting and to um, remain in the entertainment industry, hopefully. Um, I'd love to become a producer one day, uh, possibly direct and write uh, as well. Uh, in the short term, I, I, I'd love to continue working. I'm planning to go into college next year. Um, working on this movie should take about four years to shoot. It's called College. <laughs> uh, uh, and yeah, so I don't, I don't, I don't have all the details filled in yet. I have to figure it out my May first. So wish me luck. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I've got this. There's a couple of things. I got a bit over excited when we first finished Gotham. I turned a lot of stuff down, which I kind of vaguely regret now. But um, there's a, I did a, uh, I worked with a guy called Bill Marshall, who did Football Dog Soldiers and Doomsday and stuff like that. He's producing this movie that was supposed to make last year. And I very much hope to be shooting that this year in, in April, called Kruger. Um, and there's a couple of other things which I'm not on the video to talk about. <laughs> So yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, but, yeah, it'd be nice to work, work back in my own country as well. To be All the secrets. One of the things that you were saying uh, backstage that I thought was really interesting in the show that uh, what an intelligent uh, uh, man you are is that uh, you're, you're the way you're going to approach the pool. You're going to touch on that a little bit to like. Uh, like I was saying, oh, maybe you should try this, and you're like, oh, actually, I got a plan mapped out. Well, I have sort of a plan. I have a couple like perspective plans. Yeah, um, I was asked why do I want to go to college and for me I, I see it as a kind of invaluable experience where obviously I, I um, you know most people go to college kind of get a head start on their career um, in that regard I wouldn't necessarily need to need to like I don't plan on studying anything in college um, even though I would like to do that in the future but basically for me I just see it as an experience to expand myself and learn about things um, that I should know about, not at, not not for my career, but just as a member of society, things that I'm interested in, um, and just kind of satisfy my naive curiosity about the world, um, and make connections and meet people who hopefully will be friends for life, and um, you know, just kind of have. I, 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 yeah, I just I, I see it as kind of this uh, this experience that I, I don't feel like I feel like if I pass up on it now, I might regret it for. Hi. Hi again. <laughs> My question is for Denise, and it was about um, filming with Cameron and his two drastically different roles, since Jerome being like this crazy joker, and then Jeremiah being a little more cool, like calm and collected, but still he has a whole plan and strategy. So, like, what was that like the like, with him? Fantastic. Yeah, I think uh, the 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 best way to put it in one word is unpredictable. It's exactly what you said. Like the writing was unpredictable, and, um, and he brought something to the table every single day that I worked with him that I did not see coming. It was, it was always an unexpected treat, um, which as an actor is it's amazing. You know, especially when you're working on the same role, the same show for five years. Um, 
I never felt it with Gotham, um, but there were times when I felt there was the possibility of things kind of getting routine. Obviously, as I'm sure anybody who's ever seen the show knows that there it is the antithesis of, of routine um, is Gotham. I think the, the, the unexpected is expected kind of at this point. Um, and, and, and yeah, I think Cameron kind of embodied that also. And um, as an actor, uh, his character is also the writing for his characters. And uh, it was it was always, it was, like I said, it was always a treat. It was it always kept me on my toes. It always kind of challenged me. And um, I always had to push myself to react to things I didn't see coming. Right over here on this side. Hello, gentlemen. Um, my question is for Debbie. Um, not only you've worked on an amazing show like Gotham, but you've also worked on another major show called Touch with Kiefer Sutherland. And I was wondering, uh, what was your experience working on that show? And I'm curious to know your preparation for that cover because during the entire run, you only said two words. And I'm just curious to know uh, about the preparation for the character and working on that show with Kiefer. Yeah, that was an incredible experience for me. That was the first time that I had a serious job. Um, and, and when I say serious, I mean like regular job. It was month and a week. Um, and I came out of it a completely different actor. Um, you know, I think a lot of people say practice is perfect, and it's absolutely true. Acting is no exception. I, the fact that I got so much practice and so much experience um, within those two years made me, you know, just made, made me appreciate the art, the craft of acting in a, in a very different way. Working with somebody like Kiefer only only helped that. He was um, an amazing person to work with. I, I, I learned an incredible amount. I, I, and it's not even things that I can point out. I just you know, I know that I felt um, so much more confident you know, kind of coming out uh, of that show. And in terms of preparation for it, I um, I was really young. I was, I was nine when I when I booked it. I think I was ten when we shot the pilot. Um, and so I didn't really fully know what I was doing. But the director um, hired a an autistic specialist. To, to be with me for the first season. Um, and so she was extremely helpful. The, the director friend of the pilot, Francis Lawrence, who wrote a couple of Hunger Games movies, um, was phenomenal. He gave me these little kind of um, very specific things that he always wanted me to do, which kind of ended up defining my character, uh, which was brilliant. Like, just as an example, I always had, I always wore long sleeve kind of thermal shirts, and there was always a little uh, right here at the, at the bottom of the shirt, my thumb. I don't know, it's, it's, it's subtle, you, you, only, you only see it if you look for it, but every single every single one of my costumes had some kind of hole here. My thumb was always in between the cloth, and I always had a marble uh, right there between my thumb and, and the shirt. And um, Jake's, Jake is my character for this one, um, but his arms were always stiff. So even when he ran, like, he kind of made fun of me for it. It was kind of like Jake's signature run, because I always run my hand like this. <laughs> Um, and this, but, but those things kind of define the character for me, and um, I was fortunate enough because, like I said, I was very naive and very um, inexperienced going into it, and uh, I had some really great people that I could rely on that served as my safety net, and um, they kind of built the foundation. And I was able to, uh, you know, build it up from there. Thank you. Well, we've been asked this a couple of times before. The thing is, um, I think that it would be a, I can't see anyone playing any of those characters any better than they actually already were. He um, has an extraordinary sort of approach by, and a long burn, which you never very, you very rarely is allowed to get the opportunity to do, of Edward Nigma being someone who's suffering from personality disorder to Oswald Cobble. To being um, a, a tender, bullied uh, mother to child. Um, I can't see anyone else doing them any better. And I think the thing is, the great the, the thing I'm so proud about with them, the, the, the flag has been planted in the stands now with the subtextualization of all of these characters. And I think that anybody else in the future that plays them will revert to these early interpretations of what made these people. So I can't think of uh, anyone else I would have rather played or anyone else I think who is the best. I think they're all remarkable from, you know, from, from, from Jessica Lucas to Karen Wyatt to Karen Pickendover to Donald Lowe. I mean, 
Seriously, everyone came with their game, and people are always also asked, you know, how much fun did you goof around on set? But when you're with a liturgy of actors like that, you don't want to be the one to drop the ball, man. You seriously don't. And you know, you you, you turn up with your game face on, but it's everyone who's so talented. Um, if that answers your question at all, so don't think it did. Just you looking at that question, I was saying everyone was so dedicated, always, and so passionate about their work. And everybody really took it seriously. It was an amazing environment to be in. It, it only, I only felt motivated and empowered to do my very best every single day, just because I knew that everybody around me, not just the actors, but the set decorators, the costume designers, everybody really, really, really cared about what they were doing. They weren't just doing it for the paycheck. They were doing it because they wanted their product to be the very, very, very best possible version of itself. And um, you know, that, that it has a way of rubbing off on you. Put on this line right here. Hi, I have uh, two questions. One is for David, and could you please do your best impression of Christian Bale's Batman? <laughs> I said no. No, you gotta do it for him. Come, come to my, come to my table. I'll do it there. <laughs> and my second question is for both of you. Which was your favorite season to film? Uh, so this is really good. I mean, we were just about to say one. Um, some reason I, I seem to remember two. Season two being um, personally remarkable because I think we found our sort of contaminator and we found our sort of heartbeat because the first season um, there was there was just there was sort of a big discussion with the studios as well. They, they wanted to make it kind of standalone and we wanted to make it into a drama. Um, and we sort of by the second season it was our world and we inhabited it and the studios let us do exactly that. So um, we started to really discover our, our, our heartbeats and our, and our characters that I found in season two. I found my voice in season two. And I, and I thought some of the, 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 the remarkable work with with um, with, with, with young know, Master Bruce and Jerome, Jerome at the time and things like that, I thought was so exceptionally shot and operatic in its scale. And the, the costumes department seems to just, we, we felt confident as opposed to a sort of a, a sort of a mentally sort of strode. Yeah, I agree. I feel, I feel like and by season two is what we found, exactly what Sean said, we found our heartbeat. We knew what we were doing. And um, I think my favorite to film was the beginning of season four, uh, because I feel like that's when Bruce specifically was kind of finding his group. He had that vigilante thing going on, and we, we had a really awesome scene. It was only a scene, but um, in the auction scene. I don't know if you guys know what I'm talking about. But it was really, really fun to do. And um, there's just a lot, of, a lot of kind of moments like that were packed into the first half of season four for Bruce. And um, they were just so much fun to play around with. And there was a lot, there was a lot there as well. You know, as an actor, a lot for me to explore. And everybody was really uh, grateful for that. Hi, um, my name is Shannon. I was wondering, um, as the awesome comes to a close, I was wondering if there's any aspect of Batman lore that you wish the show explored more, or that it didn't explore. I feel like if you asked me this a year ago, I would have a whole list of things that I wish the show explored more. But as it's, as it's, I, I, you know, now that we finished it, I look back and I am so thankful. I mean, this is kind of a cop out answer. I'm sorry about that. Maybe Sean will give you a real answer. But um, <laughs> I, I, I'm so, I'm so thankful for what we did explore. And um, I think there's a finite things that we could really talk about. Um, and I think the whole point of the show is to explore all of these characters on a very, very human level. And, and tell the story of how regular people become uh, characters and people, become superheroes and supervillains, which are very animated, obviously kind of over the top, not regular people. Um, and I think that if you incorporate too many characters or too many stories or too many settings into that, then you lose the full organic transformation of each and every one of the characters that, uh, that, you, that you do choose to focus on. Um, so no, there isn't really one specific thing that I, that I wish we explored more. I kind of, I mean, I, I mean, especially for my character and for our relationship specifically, I think the writers did a phenomenal job. You know, kind of, I would actually like to do, do a full 90 minute version of our the real thing, you know, yeah. with the cave and the car and all that. Yeah. You know. 
Let's be honest. <laughs> we'll make a little uh, the, the, the director. Who is the director? You right there? There's the project they want to do. Right there. Make them as Batman and Bruce with all of that. That's the project you get going. Right over here. Question on this side. Hello. Hey. So two questions. First question is uh, in the show. What was the best villain villain debut? There's too many to choose from. I think we sort of said that earlier on. And this is what I loved about it was the fact that people didn't, you didn't just, you weren't just introduced to someone who was just bad. You saw them go bad. And that's the point of Batman, isn't it? Really, the reason why he's there is because this is the, the germination of, of evil and of these characters. So that would be a hard one for me to answer, really, because you watch it get worse. And that's, and then we basically need to. You know, Phoenix like from the ashes of Gotham rises the man in the Cape Crusade. Character, right? That's right, yeah, there you go. I think, I, I just think one, one of my favorite examples, it wasn't necessarily the villain, his, his debut, but his kind of presence and his evolution on the show was uh, Ray Um I just thought he came at a really cool time and his presence served kind of as a, an, an, an integral part of the story, obviously, but um, he, I think he had an effect on a lot of characters, and uh, my you know, Bruce included. And, uh, I, was, I, just, I, thought, I just thought that Alexander Siddig knocked him out of the park, and the writers knocked him out of the park with him. And, uh, yeah, it was one, one of my favorites. Anyway, second yeah, question. You guys have a new character also in season one, right? uh, which wasn't official. Yeah. That's what I meant. Right. And my second question is without any spoilers, are we going to see? Everybody is kind of great, and um, I, uh, 
yeah, I think I think that's something that I, I would love to see him taken away from. Thank you. Thank you. There's always a possibility. Probably not. No, I hate them all. Yeah, no, he's the only one I like. They also smell bad. <laughs> no, they, you know, um, and I genuinely mean this, I've been doing this job for quite some time now, and, and very rarely does this happen. It sounds kind of gushing and weird, but it's an absolute fact, is that, um, that we made, um, I mean, they're not just my friends and my, my, they're my family, crew included, I have to say, with young, with David and, and, and Robin and, and Corey, they're people I genuinely love. But it's happened to me once before in my, in my life, in my career, when I was on a job that was, um, that, that I enjoyed, that I thought could never be um, eclipsed, and got them has. And it's going to be very interesting, you know, going back to sort of reality in many respects, and working with something that is, can be, can be difficult. Um, because these guys were um, nothing but delightful and a joy. And also, there was this, like Dougie was saying earlier on, the standard was set so high, and Ben McKenzie, our sort of like ship's captain, as it were, which is something that's very English, very sort of European, we'd have table reads. And even if we weren't in the episodes, for five years, we all used to turn up to find out what happened, what going around the corner in, in, in the, on the streets of Gotham. And that kept us at a very tight unit. And there were no toys out the pram, no one playing silly, you know, silly viruses or anything like that. People were nothing but delightful to each other and we became incredibly close. We used to hang out together. A bit weird. Thank you. We're about to wrap this session up, but uh, David and Sean will be at their table, but I can take one more question for each side. So right over here. Hi, yes, uh, quick question for the uh, Batman Alfred Bruce. Do you remember the Batman 43 and 49, the old World War II stuff, the 15 chapter stuff back then? How did you, uh, did you guys compare that Batman, the war stuff, to like the stuff now before you started, like still practical films and, you know, references and stuff like that? I, uh, personally, I try to stay away from, I'm not an aficionado at all, um, but I try to stay away from a lot of that. But for personal, um, from personal experience about being, being an actor and being in many other things before, I haven't trained with SNS and things like that. You try and colour your palette with the experiences that you've had. Um, and the originally, uh, Bruno Hannes' version was, I think it's in the Earth One books, he talks about uh, being a Marine. I wanted to change him to SNS because I had the, 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 the opportunity to train with him for a while. And I like the idea that they're, that they're incredibly adaptable, which I thought would be next one in life and be very useful for the man that becomes the bat. The fact that he can virtually do everything. Please. I'm Batman. 